Thank you, Van, and thank you all for being here. Um, each of you is very, very special <laughs> with an audience this small during such a strange time of the pandemic. Um, it is an honor to be able to conclude this very long pro project called Imagination Squared Pathways to Resilience. And we're going to kick it off with how to paint an apple. Um, not to worry. Uh, you are not gonna have to do an art class, but I would love it if you would go on a little imaginary journey with me. Imagine that we had all stepped into an art class together and we all had five years of painting experience and each of us had the same paints and the same paint brushes. We all were staring at the same apple under the same light and we were all even standing in the same space, which is hard to imagine today, but um, this is imaginary. And what do you think those apples would end up looking like given all the same structures? They would vary tremendously, even with the same skill sets and with all of the same structures around you. Some would be dramatic, some would be colorful, some would be moody and dark, some would be rushed, some would be so slow they didn't get finished, some would be off-centered, some would be emphasizing the holistic look, and some would be caught in details. And that is the nature of human interpretation. And it was in these early teaching class, teaching that I did with kids, middle schoolers, and little old ladies that I began to see this really remarkable thing about simple objects being painted and reflected back by the uniqueness of each of us. And so I had some key lessons at that time. We each have unique ways of seeing and interpreting the same scene. Our variation is what makes us um, what is what makes the collection of interpretations powerful and inspiring. There is no best answer. The power is in the collective. And the creative collection celebrates vulnerability, egalitarian structure, and uniqueness. And anyone can participate and create some serious cultural and individual shifts um, without skills. This takes me on a turn in my career, um, this kind of realization that I wanted to start working in um, community projects and dealing with people's interpretations of experiences and those variations. And so I left my museum position um, working in high art and chose something where I could really work out my ideas and look at um, how different communities might respond to different prompts. And most of this was happening in a hospital setting because I took the position as director of arts and medicine in a very large inner city hospital in Jacksonville. And they just gave me free range to try anything I wanted to with anybody I wanted to. And it was an extraordinary experience. Um, and so I want to take you quickly through a few of these. These are certainly not all of them. I probably did 20 different projects throughout the course of eight years. but. Uh, this one's working with stroke patients, um, and they were painting a collaborative painting, many of them not able to use their favorite arm. So it was a really fascinating experience. This one was working in, with Jacksonville University undergrads in a commission uh, to honor organ donors, and it won one of the top State of Florida awards that year. Um, and that turned into a really cool operation where we were doing um, visits back and forth and they were learning about healthcare restrictions and, and contracts and public art. And then um, we were learning about how to navigate working with fine artists instead of signage people and things like that. So it was a really big turn to hire fine artists instead of people who might make just a regular old sign. Um, this is a 40-foot uh, wall installation of people who died on the table in surgery and then returned to live and talk about the world of resilience um, after those moments and how they are living now. So that was a, this was a powerful installation that was set up just outside of the Trauma One waiting area to allow people who were waiting for loved ones in there to have um, some kind of hope that there might be um, a positive outcome. Uh, this is a series of uh, car greeting cards that uh, adult patients that were bedridden were making on to wish homeless children um, sort of positive and inspiring thoughts to give them encouragement. 
And that was a way of activating a group of people who would otherwise feel depressed and powerless to be relevant in the community. And I, all, all the while I'm learning what it is as I'm kind of moving through these things about what's driving behind each project. Uh, this one is where I just, I have six, there's 6,000 employees in this hospital system. And I'm like, this is a, a group of people that are coming to work every day and sitting at a desk and typing out data. And um, I don't know, I just wanted to test out whether if I did a call for photography in and amongst the everyday people, if that would have any kind of ripple. And it was a game changer. This is, this is one hallway. It took me two years to secure the hallway, because as you all know, territories are hard to conquer. But once I could get the hallway kind of cleared out of whatever used to be there, um, I was able to put up this giant exhibition, and it ended up saving an enormous amount of corporate funds, but also made the employees very proud of their work and a lot of buzz in, in the um, morale. So it was really positive. Um, and they use these photographs now in every single office and every single campus. Uh, a series of signs that was very simple, uh, five-foot signs that basically asked the employees to talk, uh, tell me their favorite public quote. They didn't have to do anything creative, but they felt famous because they got posted sort of near their office, and all of a sudden, everyone's coming up and telling me that people really love the quote I picked. And it was really simple, but it was a huge thing. I got notes from everybody. Um, I started to work in neurology and uh, worked with different people, different kinds of disabilities in the process and started to do Alzheimer's and Parkinson's programs with music um, and tempo and kind of interpretation of color and sound combinations. Um, in this particular day that's photographed um, on the right, the, um, something happened that kind of stalled the program and um, I think Elvis, came, we were playing all kinds of different types of music from different eras and Elvis came on and everyone that could jumped out of their chair and started to dance. It was really powerful. But they had just, they thought they were coming in for Parkinson's content. They came monthly and so all of a sudden they were doing this and it was just the most joyful day. So, um, And then another thing that happened that was very interesting is um, for bedridden patients that, you know, had the use of at least one arm and, you know, it varied in a huge hospital like that. You're dealing with cancer patients, you're dealing with you know, um, pregnancies um, that are just, you know, someone kind of bedridden and waiting and completely capable of doing anything. People hooked up in epilepsy, a sort of, um, you know, uh, wiring and having to wait for a seizure to come on. I mean, all kinds of different situations. So we started a program throughout the entire campus of having ceramic bowls being made and people just putting the word they were thinking about that day. And then they could take the bowl home and then we photographed it. We started to put them along these long hallways. And the really interesting thing about the cultural shifts that started to happen was that the physicians who are really busy saving lives and the nurses too, like there's an intensity in the hallways that was, you know, um, no one's, it was really a, a very intense world. And all of a sudden there's these wacky words coming off of these these walls, and it started to really generate a change throughout the entire culture of this place. They start, it started to soften. It started to feel the voice of the patient, and, the, and that became, the, that is, is, of course, the mission, too, is to have healthy patients, and suddenly there was this mission sort of showing up as part of this aesthetics, and it was a really interesting thing. Um, as I went to management meetings, um, which I don't think, I think our management meetings had maybe six or 700 people in them. Um, you know, I started to see that they were using my work as the new icons for their work. And so they were taking the tree of life and this and other things, and they were putting that on their slides because they were so proud of the culture that they were coming from, they being the physicians or they being the other managers. And so that was a really interesting thing in terms of logo and icon and cultural shifts. So um, this work was really profound to see on many levels, uh, which leads me to making a bigger statement. And so in 2010, I have this idea to uh, pass out five-inch wood squares to anybody that wants to do something to them, promising that I'll put them somewhere public. And I had this wonderful friend of mine that helped do that with me. And we just were sitting there one day and thought, well, maybe this could work. And throughout Jacksonville, it was just viral. Immediately, they were pay being picked up and coming back within three months. And so we were able to secure the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, which had um, an amazing display here. Um, this particular photograph uh, 
looks, makes it look really small and sort of quiet, but I assure you it was packed. Um, it was, a, the opening night was um, a record-breaking attendance and had, I think, something like two or three blocks of lines waiting in the rain to get in. It was unbelievable. Um, and this was just to see this exhibition of little five-inch squares that 910 people had made. Uh, it left the, the, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Jacksonville, and it landed at the main library in Jacksonville in downtown, and it was permanently given to the city. So that's what happened to that project. It had no prompt. Um, but I learned a lot about projects by that time, and what I learned was the more I could give up control, the more beautiful it became. It was harder on my end, but it was more interesting in the end. So that was a really important um, component for me. Um, in 2014, I moved to um, Athens with my wonderful partner, and um, by about 2017, I'm, I'm thinking about Athens and kind of interested in the whole town and the extraordinary diversity here, economically, racially, um, religious uh, interests. Everything was really interesting and a bit polarized, um, and I was very curious about what kind of um, community response or interpretation could come out of this community. And so I also concurrently was starting my MFA at the University of Georgia and so sort of roped it into that, but started, decided I would bring back the Imagination Squared shared platform of a five inch square, but then add a prompt. And thanks to Amy Roseman, um, we kind of landed, she helped me land on this word resilience that had been buzzing around in the ecology world. Um, and of course, so super saturated, but kind of an interesting word when it comes down to uh, the research being done at UGA, coupled with the ability for a middle schooler or a teenager or an older person to relate to in terms of what might bridge research to the community. So uh, that's where it starts is an Athens project with five inch squares for free with the, with the prompt, how do you define resilience in your life or your work? And shortly thereafter, there were squares and instructions and carts going out into the world of Athens in 2018 um, over the course of select weeks and months and select community partnerships. Um, and people started to slowly respond. I think one of the most important obstacles in the project is the fact that creativity is inherently vulnerable. And so people might pick up a square and think, oh yeah, I can do this. And then all of a sudden they sit down to do it and a whole bunch of ego-related issues kind of fly in um, about um, whether or not they're good or that they can do anything, whether they should put anything up, whether they like what they made, all of these things. Um, and so it ends up kind of moving through about 10 minutes of pretty extreme vulnerability, and you have to kind of climb over that cliff to sort of land with, okay, I'm going to do this. And so we ended up with, um, well, I think I'm jumped ahead, but we ended up with over 1,000 squares, um, which surpassed the previous uh, exhibition in Jacksonville. So one of the things that happens that's really important um, at the same time in 2018 is, uh, my family and I go up to D.C. for the gun march. We, I know you guys don't even remember that we used to talk about gun control. Um, and so that was only three years ago. But we used to actually think about whether or not guns were a big deal. Now we have really so much bigger issues that have suddenly stepped in. But that was just a few years ago. And um, at the time, it was, if you'll recall, it was the Parkland High School teenagers who had really started to make um, an incredibly powerful statement. And they were the very first people I know of that was moving the dial a little bit on gun control. And so at the end of this uh, march in DC, I was sort of blown away by those teenagers. I mean, you might remember some faces coming to mind about some of, the, some of them that really made it into the mainstream media. But I also started to realize that, you know, they're minors. Um, they, don't really, they don't really classify in a lot of areas of community. Um, they can't vote, you know, all kinds of stuff. So all of a sudden I was like, this is really important that teens are in this project. I mean, I need to make this, like, central. And so um, I basically uh, envisioned for this that they, I was kind of looking at teens like, okay, they, they really are dealing with resilience in a way that even when I was a teen, I wasn't. I mean, social media has changed everything, and their resilience is extraordinary right now. So I sort of 
magically thought about um, a moment where if, the, if a teenager who had a really difficult time staying in high school um, and made a square that was really about anything that had to do with his, his or her life, having that square sit next to one of these really uh, established you know, ecologists that have been studying resilience for 30 years, and that they both at five inches would sit next to each other in this exhibition and share the same space and be both masters of resilience. And I, was, I thought that was sort of the thing that kind of carried me throughout um, the project. I got through about midway through the project and realized that there was no way to define Athens in any creative way without including sound. And so sound was incorporated into the project and um, I won a grant with uh, the Office of Sustainability and um, started to get work on what were called sound squares. And they were these really cool individually wired things with buttons. So by February 2020, buttons are not really allowed in our public life any longer. We cannot touch any things. They kind of collapse with COVID, but they were a huge part of the effort. Um, and in that course, um, I started to work with other collaborators on sound, and I will share some examples in just a minute. Uh, the results for Imagination Squared Pathways to Resilience is as follows. Uh, 1,104 total responses to resilience. Uh, 1,030 visual resilience squares were in this project, and 74 responses in sound. It goes to the Linden House in the middle of COVID, <laughs> the quietest moments ever. Um, and that was its design initially. Uh, so it was going to, the whole collection went there. We had an area on the floor, an area in the back, et cetera. Um, and that was a beautiful exhibition. Uh, they did have some timed entries at that time, but it was just, it's just been a strange thing to put a community project together when the community can't be together. So, um, and so that was certainly um, a highlight. This is a highlight. Uh, I had no idea this was going to happen, so it was really wonderful to see this really cool cover come in September of 2021. And then, thanks to Forrest helping, um, we were able to secure um, this spot with a grant from the um, ACAC here. And um, we installed Imagination Squared upstairs uh, on August 18th. And now I'm gonna tell you a few of these stories. Um, I started off with athletes. I don't know why. I, my first, like my first marketing was right over to the UGA Athletic Center. And I decided that that would be very interesting because A, they're probably not at all like interested in a creative activity. So it was a good challenge for me. And then B, they're really experts in resilience. To be a D1 athlete, you have to have um, endured so much to get to Georgia Athletics. So I was making presentations to all of the athletes and their leadership, and a whole bunch of athletes participated in this project initially. It was part of the trial period and sort of just a testing phase. And so most of them came back anonymous, but this was, a lot of them came back with um, crosses, which is kind of an interesting thing. So out of the athletics came a lot of Christian symbols, um, but these are three that I pulled out just as examples. Um, a baseball player, the one on the far right is from a, fe a, a female basketball player, and then the one on the left, I don't know where it comes from, but a great, great square that's just scribbled in there with an ace bandage wrapping it together. So it's a very, it was a really creative and smart way to handle it. This is um, a, a Sira is a seventh grader, and she did this extraordinary square on how she loves to read when she's having a bad day. They're the first, I don't know, is a really fascinating start. When I first opened it up, I'd say the first 20 squares were about depression and mental health. I mean, literally, like, I was a little nervous. I was like, this is just going to be a mental health discussion. But it, it leveled out in the end. But I think the, it, the mental health people felt urgently like they wanted to participate. And so they were on the very front end of this. It was very interesting. So um, a lot of mental health response a ton on water and nature and ecological concerns and environment. Um, I just pulled out water here just to give you an example of the variation. Um, the second one, the left in the middle, is from the UGA watershed, which is a really creative square, using beads just talking about the local waterways um, and their mission. 
Two slides here from uh, PhD students that at the School of Ecology. The left one's from Anya, and it was about um, the threats to resilience in coral reef systems. And then the one on the right from Michelle about mosquitoes and um, our resilience to infectious diseases. This is a fantastic square. I hope you can find it upstairs. Um, I've tried to put it low so you could see it. But this is a seventh grader named Braylon, and he made a square that's specific, that is amazingly um, Martin Luther King giving the I Have a Dream speech, 1963, at um, the Washington Memorial. <laughs> and he's got the whole speech along the perimeter. So it's just, it's just beautiful. Um, a lot of diversity squares came in, and this, the left one's from Nethra, and she uh, was, has sort of a very strong symbolism using these colored pins about diversity in communities and community resilience. And the one on the right is from Sanaz, and uh, she was in my MFA program with me and from Iran and doing work that um, basically unveiled the faces of women from Iran and dealing with... Um, women's rights and freedoms in Iran. So a very powerful square that we can't read unless you know how to read um, her native language. So that was kind of cool because it also has sort of a secrecy. Um, but she has the poem uh, on the stories on the website. So um, if you would like to read it, it's all written out. There were just some that were about color and shape and had no stories at all. And there were a lot of religious squares because we are in the Bible Belt, and that is what part of our um, cross-section of our community is. And so you will see a lot of different um, aspects to faith. Uh, what was really cool coming back was the response in the Black Lives Matter movement and the different ways of showing power um, and empowerment in different capacities. Uh, I wish I could show all of them. What is interesting is that this project sort of immediately shuts down in February 2020, um, but uh, the tipping point for the Black Lives Matter, which was of course brewing, is about May. So it, we don't even hit in this project, we don't hit George Floyd, Floyd's death, and we don't hit a lot of the things that were really happening right after that. But so these were already sort of, you know, a big part of what was important for people to talk about. Um, a lot of squares on love and a lot of squares on LGBTQ. And there are a lot of angry squares. And that's such an important thing to note that this wasn't just a joyful experience for some people. There were some people that just wanted to take their five inch square and say something to someone else. <laughs> and I loved that, honestly. They genuinely came in anonymous and that was part of the project was that you could have anonymity. Um, but these were all very cool. Uh, there was, conversely, there were squares that were meant to tell others um, words of encouragement. The, the squares on immigration really grabbed my heart. Um, they were deep stories about, um, and, and at the time, in, in 17 and 18, uh, the ICE situation of immigration was really at play, and I think these were mostly teenagers that were writing some of these immigration squares and talking about their grandparents in other countries that they couldn't have access to, and, and parents even. Um, and so those are beautiful stories that are as part of this collection. And then there were some that were just being destroyed by something heavy. <laughs> and that was cool, too, that the test of the square itself being the, the measure of resilience. Um, and then there were bereavement squares. And so as with art in any capacity, it is inherently legacy-based, and it represents life and people we love and uh, that kind of symbolism. And this is Helen Square, and she um, had had an experience... And I'm changing the name on some of these just because I didn't know who was going to show up. And, you know. But um, she basically had an experience where she lost her um, grandchild and, a, and her, her daughter in a car accident. And um, she really spoke about the grief that she had such a hard time um, just living. And so she talked about resilience as just staying in the days and living through grief. And so that was profound. Um, this is a powerful moment for, that I have as a project administrator. But basically, 
uh, Clark Middle School did a whole bunch of squares, and I would drop them off at the beginning of the semester, like 400 squares, and then I would pick them all up at the end of the semester. And so they got more time than the rest of the public did because the teachers were distributing them in and amongst the curriculum, which was also very fascinating. Um, so I get 300 squares back, and they're all disheveled and in crazy order. And when I had to work with minors, I had to get permission. Uh, and so I had permission slips that went with the squares. And so it had, you know, I get permission that my child's square can go on the internet, that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, if I'm going to have a piece of paper come back from the child, I might as well make it an essay. <laughs> and so I started to ask questions so that the kid had to fill out what they thought resilience was and if they could think of examples of resilience and who is the most resilient person you know. And I just thought that would be a fascinating thing to be able to get back from middle schoolers. And so um, the problem was when I get them all back, I have to type it all in to put it into the website. So I'm typing and typing and typing, and I bump into one. And we'll just say her name's Maddie, and she says on one of these questions. Um, I would like to, I guess I would say that James is my, the most resilient person I know because James, um, I know he's really sad every day, but he smiles because his dad has cancer. And so he's always smiling and he always cracks jokes at me. And so then I do, okay, great. I don't remember what that square looks like offhand, um, but I note that that's kind of interesting. And then I bump into the one that's James's square. And James says, my dad is the most resilient person I have ever met. He is so wonderful. He has had cancer and he's like still so nice to me and we still do things even though I know his whole body hurts. And then I'm like, oh gosh, you know, and I think, I'm not positive, but I think that might be James's square. Um, and so then uh, I'm still typing and typing and typing, and I bump into, like, Bobby's square. And Bobby's square says, you have to realize time has been going by on, during all this. And so Bobby's square says, my most resilient person is James. His dad died, and he is still smiling, and I am so happy he's my friend. And so I was really dealing with time and legacy in this project, all being driven by seventh graders. Um, and so that was really profound that they were looking at each other for um, inspiration as well. And that's a downer, I realize, but I thought it's sort of profound and sometimes um, these projects go in that direction and that's part of not controlling it. Um, I wanna share with you uh, three different pieces that came out of the sound side of the project. Uh, that my slides got a little bit confused, so I think we're gonna listen to one from Caleb, but I'll tell you about it after. My soul. My soul. My soul. Caleb Craig's work, and he's an, actually an art student at Lamar. He was. He's graduated, but he's an art student at Lamar Dodd, and he was working on um, some multimedia pieces, sculpture, music, video, all together, um, and he's extraordinarily talented and kind of working in the LGBTQ realm for this work. The next one. Hey, down in Georgia, hope you've had a hope good day. Hey, down in Georgia, hope you've had a hope good, had a good day. day. Got you some rest. A little cool. Hey, and girl, they, how's the weather today? Could hot down sunny into the 80s. So have a good day. Nice, you know, hope had a good day. Hope you 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 had a good day. Tree have old a good timing and cake tomorrow will be popping the Christmas so we so did a little of it. Man, it looked Nana went to the and went out to lunch I with Brandon and said we could get them out of Florida. And I moved the field. So Nana and I had a, have, have a good time. Have a good so night. Have a good night. Love tomorrow. Hope and pop love Papa and Nana. Wow. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, not sure which part was accurate or inaccurate, but that was a very interesting piece by Maggie, and she's in the Hodgson School of Music, and. 
all of the, the students that came through, um, I was working with a collaborator who basically incorporated this project into his music program at the University of Georgia. And he um, basically signed them that he wanted a one minute piece uh, from the composers, the musicians, and the singers on what the sounds of resilience are in their life. And so it was really fantastic work that was being done. And they had three weeks to do it. Um, and they all had different backgrounds in music and sound. And so this was Maggie, and what she chose was, uh, I'm going to read her story to you. It's on the website, but this is what she said. As a child, my grandfather was told that he was never going to amount to anything. He probably has dyslexia, but just as I, undiagnosed. Despite all these comments from friends and loved ones, he not only married and had a son, but he also was a loyal employee to his company and served the National Guard and volunteered as a local firefighter. Fighter. Though all these things are amazing and fulfilling, many people know him now for how he cares for people. He makes an effort to get to know people and never finds himself somewhere where he can't make a friend. My papa has always gone above and beyond for me and all the people around him. Even when I am living states away, he learned how to text so that he can care for me from afar while I'm in college. He sends me texts every day. This audio is him reading a handful of my texts back to me. And that's what you were listening to. So... Um, and so that was a very interesting version of resilience. And then the next one, since um, this seems to be not as smooth, <laughs> never know what you're going to get all of a sudden, um, is by a student named Paul. And as you listen to this one, I want you to listen for the saxophone sound. And he used his saxophone as his symbol of resilience. And the saxophone itself goes from weak and jumbled to powerful and strong. So... Hopefully, we will. That was called Blossom. So imaginationsquare.org is where all of this is housed and the images of the 1,030 squares and the 74 um, pieces of sound in, in the study of resilience here in Athens. And back to the ego of a five inch square, it's clearly, uh, it, these individual squares really matter, but when we look at it on a wall in front of us, it's clear that it is the power of the collective. It's that we're tethered in space and time to this moment, and um, we are part of something larger than ourselves. And so our stories about perceptions of beauty and pain and our recovery of each vibrate to a powerful amplification of community resilience in the end. And that concludes the visuals, but I have a lot of people that helped with this, so I'm going to give you three slides of lots of things. So I was highly funded um, by many groups and very grateful for those um, different contributions and a whole bunches of individuals that helped along the path of three years of this project, um, each of whom I'm so grateful for. Many here who are sitting here. <laughs> um, and then I had a lot of community partners that let me plunk my carts in places. So I'm very grateful to all of them. And most of all, I'm thankful for the 1,002 different people that participated in this project who took the risk uh, to engage in the community. So thank you.
Uh, if it, does anyone have any questions at this point about anything, whether it's about the project that's here or any other projects? Nope. Hi, Amy. <laughs> yes, Amy in the front. <laughs> I love your stories of how your art transformed had this impact in the hospitals and the hospital in general. And just wonder what you have thought about in the last two or three years about anything you thought of where art could transform a place outside of Imagination Square. What, what any of the ideas you have that are rolling around? I don't know that I have focused on it, you know, mostly because I was way inside the MFA and doing this project. So I haven't really looked at Athens in a capacity of what, it, I mean, you're, you're looking at a stiff corporate, like a corporate, real corporate entity or a fear-driven culture that could really use transformation. And so the hospital is a rigid environment with an enormous number of rules and a ton of liability. And so the entire structure was like, no, no, everything was no. And so I was just sort of teaching people what the yeses might bring, essentially. I mean, so I don't know if there's, I mean, sure, there's hospitals here that would certainly fit the bill. Um, but if, I think it's got a rich potential in the future for corporate um, considerations, is for sure. I, I think my big takeaway was that um, when, when a committee of people came to me because they saw me as the creative entity in the hospital, which was kind of funny, but um, they basically put me in this high-level administrative meeting and said, okay, we need you to find a really good um, donor wall. We need a donor wall. Um, and we, not, we want those brass plaques with the big oak thing. And I just said, oh, gosh, could, if you could just give me one year, give me some time, not money, I will make something beautiful. And that's where that tree of life came out of. Um, they wanted to, and the, the in, in initiation of that project was that nurses had come, become very attached to their patients um, and they would lose patients, of course, in a major accident or a situation where they could have organ donation, which is a very morbid discussion, but also beautiful because all these other people receive organs and live. And so there was this immense story that hadn't been told, but the nurses wanted to start honoring the people that gave away their lives so that there was another thing besides a cemetery for their family members to see. It's really an interesting start, that impetus. But... Um, it turned into this tree of life, and they were so happy. And, and so it is, it is an interesting study. I really just haven't tapped into it a whole lot, but happy to go forward with you on it. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes? Yeah. Um, you talked about the like, control of the project. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I know you touched on it, but I'm kind of curious how the project ended versus how it began for you. Like, you know, things always sort of change. There's a, that's a great question. Um, and... Uh, it makes the entire process excruciatingly vulnerable. So you might know how you want to control it, and, you can, and you've made some philosophical decisions not to, and then you're always up against that place. Like, am I going to control this? So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, somewhere in the middle of the project, and I had to... Real, I, well, I realized that people couldn't do the project because they didn't have... The, like materials to do the project. So I started a loaner program where I had to put together all these boxes and people could borrow boxes of weird things with a whole bunch of adhesives in different ways that I could maybe generate like, you know, so you could drop it off into a workshop or a class. And so that became this really interesting sort of second part. So I, um, I, before I get that kind of figured out and while it's growing, I go to, there's a person who's really interested in having the project in her population of people. And that was um, Hope Haven. And so Hope Haven, I don't know if you know much about that group, but they're basically um, d individuals that are kind of, I don't even know, um, they have d some kind of disability and they basically are, are in vocational settings and being helped vocationally to um, live independently, essentially. And it's a fantastic uh, uh, nonprofit. And they wanted to do this, on about they wanted to have this resilience project and they had, I think, something like 60 or 70 people in the project, so a pretty substantial amount. And something happened in the communication of the project so the person who wanted to do it understood the project fully, and the person who implemented the project didn't. And that gap right there 
made for a really, I mean, what could have been extraordinary turned into, you know, um, popsicle sticks and feathers as the only thing that was were passed out at that day. And so that was a critical moment for me to dig deep in how, what, I didn't control that piece. I didn't say, uh, I never thought to say you can only have feathers and popsicle sticks and glitter. So it was a really interesting moment in lack of control. And, and it was uh, meaningful because it didn't matter. I mean, I, I had to just hammer it out with myself. It was like it didn't matter. It ended up completely being perfect in the end. I just had to reshape that kind of thing that I expected these to be unique and individual responses. And this cluster came back looking really similar. And I had to just kind of figure out how that was going to work. And it just had to work philosophically. <laughs> that was the shift. It was, I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, that's a great question. I think that's just an example, but there was lots of moments of um, not having control. Van? Um, I always have some ideas, but I don't have plans. So I guess it's like in a lower level. But yeah, thank you. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Valerie. I knew you would love it. <laughs> it is gorgeous. I love it. I'm so glad you love it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really happy with it. It just looks, it's just like so perfect. Um, Patty? Is it staying there? I didn't hear you. Is it staying there? It's permanent. Yes. Sorry, I should have had that in my, in my slideshow. It's a permanent gift to the city. So it is Athenians um, creating responses to resilience for future decades to look at and consider individual and collective resilience in Athens. So thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.